All right, we're gonna get going here. All right, so what we're gonna do um, today is uh, might end up being a little bit overwhelming, but we're gonna continue on the tour of microbial diversity. And this is both to introduce you to the phylogenetic diversity of life and to give you some examples of features that we think are of interest. And then in part, a lot of the introduction we're doing um, today will also set up in all of next week's classes where we're going to talk more about features of microbes than the lineages of microbes. Um, but we need some background information on the different lineages in order to then talk about both the biology of uh, different groups and the evolutionary origins and development of some of their interesting features. Uh, so, um, so what we're going to do is um, uh, take you on a, a tour of the seven major lineages of eukaryotes, in particular on this list, the first five of them, because the last two are going to be covered much more later in the course. Um, and these are the, the, rest of the, tr the rest of the tree um, that I talked about in the last lecture. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about, re-discuss re um, a little bit about the complications in evolutionary history. And in particular, um, uh, what we'll talk about is, again, the endosymbiosis origin of eukaryotes and how eukaryotes have this complex evolutionary history. Uh, just a little bit of information about that. And if we have time, we might get into, right at the end, this issue of lateral gene transfer, but that'll probably end up being uh, next week. Um, so again, what we're going to do, and I know many of these um, lineages, you will not personally uh, be familiar with the names of these groups, um, but you probably are familiar with at least representatives of these groups or the effects of these groups. Um, and what we're going to do is go through these lineages, so alveolates, stromenopiles, and rhizaria, excavates, and amoebozoans. And we will also briefly touch on plants, and then this last lineage, which are called the epistocots. And since that includes animals and fungi, which we will spend much more time on later in the course, um, we're not going to go into that group in detail, but we will, I'll spend just a couple of minutes on this one lineage that turns out to be the sister group of animals, and it's uh, got a lot of interesting biology that people are looking at to compare to animals. Um, when we talked about the bacterial and archaeal groups, I emphasized that most of what we know about their evolutionary history is based upon molecular data, primarily analysis of that same gene that Carl Woese looked at in the 1970s, this ribosomal RNA gene, reading the sequence of that gene and then building evolutionary trees of that gene. And people have also looked at whole genomes of bacteria and archaea and a variety of other genes in bacteria and archaea. But primarily we use sequence information as are characters and character states because phenotypic information even physiological information is not uh, a good indicator of the relatedness of bacteria and archaea. With the eukaryotes, really all of the eukaryotic lineages, although I'll talk in more detail about some of them and how this applies, morphological information is much more useful for both inferring their relatedness but also that means that if you want to identify a particular organism, either today, one that you find today, or even in the fossil record, you can use their appearance as a much better indicator of what they are um, than you can for bacteria and archaea. Um, I didn't really mention this with bacteria and archaea, but um, it's true for them and also true for eukaryotes. 
Uh, we're going to present the current model for the evolutionary relationships among these lineages. Um, much of it seems reasonably robust and well supported, but there are some details that are still a uh, bit in, in debate, and when those are particularly important, I will bring those up. Um, and then a term that's used a little bit uh, in the book, and we may or may not use on or off here, is when we look at this tree, um, m most of the representatives of these other lineages are single-celled and microbial. You can't really see them well without the aid of a microscope. And they frequently are just referred to as microbial eukaryotes, even though it turns out a few representatives of these groups are multicellular. Sometimes they're referred to as protists, uh, which is basically an, another term for microbial eukaryotes. Both of those terms are uh, sort of general descriptions. None of them are monophyletic groupings, but uh, people frequently use them. But really what we're going to do is talk about, as I mentioned before, everything except plants, animals, and fungi, all the rest of the eukaryotes. And in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, we're going to go through uh, description of many of these lineages. For those seven major groups of eukaryotes, the assignment of organisms to those groups is based by, on some type of phylogenetic analysis, either of morphological characters or molecular characters or both of them. And um, once organisms have been put into all these groups, people have then looked for whether or not those groups have synapomorphies, that is, shared derived traits that all of the all or virtually all of the representatives of those groups have in common. And when I go through these groups, I will list some of those synapomorphies for the particular groups. Um, so for example, this first lineage that we're going to talk about is the alveolates. And the name comes from a synapomorphy that they have, that they share in common. It's these sacs, which are also called alveoli, that are beneath the surface of the cell membrane. That's also called the plasma membrane. And um, all representatives of this group uh, are single cellular. Many of them, though definitely not all of them, are photosynthetic. And so now we're going to go just quickly describe the three major groups within the alveolates. Um, there are many uh, other lineages within many of these groups that we will not talk about. What we're going to focus on it's the ones covered in the book, and the, the, the ones that they selected to cover in the book were really selected because they're either the best studied or they contain organisms that have big impact on either the global climate or human health or agriculture or some other property. But there are many other lineages within these groups that we will not uh, talk about really at all. There's a lot of diversity here. So the dinoflagellates are the first of the group of alveolates. There are two little uh, videos here of different dinoflagellate species. Um, the dinoflagellates are um, mostly marine. That is, they live in saltwater environments. Most of them are photoautotrophic. Uh, that they fix carbon and contribute a great deal to, as the primary producers, for a variety of ecosystems. Um, the, the name dinoflagellates comes from the fact that they have these two flagella, one of them that wraps around this uh, equatorial groove on the cells and one that is connected to this longitudinal groove. And they use those to both spin around and swim as well as to carry out various feeding functions. There are a lot of both important primary producers in these groups and as we'll talk about later when we talk about animals, um, at least I think this may come up when we talk about animals. Uh, coral, for example, many of them have dinoflagellate symbionts that live inside of them that carry out photosynthesis for their coral hosts. Um, so we're going to have a clicker question.
So the dinoflagellates are photoautotrophic. So um, what is the difference between photoautotrophy and photoheterotrophy? And I'll give you till something like 115 or so. All right, five seconds. Get in your answers. Everyone in? All right. Woohoo! 90% um, of you say the source of carbon. Um, that's good, because that's the correct answer. Um, I know, the little pause, the little pause. Um, so uh, you, you really should. Make sure you learn that grid that I showed you before on the different aspects of the nutrition of organisms, because when we talk about both the diversity of life and many of the different biological features and processes, again, we're going to just quickly refer to autotrophic, heterotrophic, lithotrophic, etc., and you have to know what all of those um, terms mean. Um, so now back to the tour of different lineages. The second major group of alveolates are known as the apicomplexans. The name comes from the fact that they, they share a synapomorphy. All the organisms in this group have this collection of organelles that you can see at this tip of the cell called the apical complex. So the apical complex that leads to the apicomplexan um, name. All of the known members of this group are parasitic. Uh, and it includes the causative agent of malaria. So in humans, one of the species that does that is Plasmodium falciparum. The book has an interesting discussion of the life cycle of Plasmodium falciparum, where it goes through multiple stages, and it has to get carried through a mosquito and then transmitted to, in this case, humans or some other animal, if it's a different species of Plasmodium, where it infects blood cells and then goes through its life cycle stages both in the mosquito host and in the human host. Uh, and um, we will talk a little bit more about plasmodium and malaria when we talk about the evolutionary history of chloroplasts because the, um, these organisms have an organelle called an apicoplast that is evolutionarily derived from chloroplasts. The third major group of alveolates are the ciliates. Um, I think on the slides that I posted, it said this, the structure is identical to flagella of cilia. It's not actually identical. The sort of core parts of cilia are the same as eukaryotic flagella, but the, the complete structure is not identical. Um, so I crossed that out. Um, most of the paramecia are heter heterotrophic. They're a very diverse group, and they use, a lot of them use the cilia that are on the outside of the cells to feed so they can sweep food particles into um, a little compartment that they then bring inside the cell. And they also use the cilia to swim around and you can find them in ponds and a lot of other aquatic environments. There's incredible morphological diversity within the group. Um, there are, uh, there's a really interesting property that they all have which is that they all have two nuclei, so the DNA inside eukaryotes, most species have one nucleus where the DNA is packaged inside each cell. All the ciliates have two, and they do a very interesting thing with these nuclei, which is um, in uh, basically the two different nuclei are kind of the equivalent to germ cells versus somatic cells in animals. 
One of these participates in sexual reproduction and is kept in reserve, basically, for all other times in the life cycle of the cell. So it's basically held there like germ cells are and is only used for sexual reproduction, which only occurs occasionally in these ciliates. And then the other nucleus is sort of the equivalent to what we see in the rest of the body in animals, the somatic cells, and that nucleus participates in active metabolic processes. It's where all genes that are made in the cell are transcribed and the proteins that come from them are translated. And it's a very interesting sort of biological process. There are a few key model organisms that are used for studies of eukaryotes in the ciliates. One in particular is called tetrahymena, and that's where telomeres, which I've mentioned before, were discovered. It's where a variety of important parts of the eukaryotic cell were discovered. Um, all right, we're going to switch now. Again, continuing with this uh, tour to the second major lineage of eukaryotes, known as the stromenopiles. Uh, actually have no idea where that name specifically came from, but I'm sure it has something to do with this synapomorphy, um, which is they all have two flagella, and in um, one of the flagella, flagellum, one of the flagella, uh, they have these tubular hairs on the outside of it, and those are used for a variety of functions. So again, um, if you knew nothing, if, if you had a new organism, and you were looking at it in a microscope and you could resolve some of these features, these synapomorphies can be very useful for quick classification of a new single-celled microbial eukaryote. Uh, there are three main lineages that we'll talk about in the stromenopiles, the brown algae, the diatoms, and the oomycetes. The brown algae, you may not, again, be familiar per se with the group, but I'm sure you're familiar, most people are familiar with some of the representatives, so giant kelp is a member of the brown algal group, and you can see when you go to marine environments, um, they're almost exclusively marine, but you can see in uh, you know, the tidal areas or washed up on the beach, or if you go into the water, lots of examples of brown algae. They um, are all multicellular. That multicellularity evolved separately from the multicellularity in plants. They have many there are many representatives in these groups that have phenotypic similarities to particular plants in terms of you know, root-like structures and leaf-like structures and a variety of other features. Those are the result of convergent evolution. They do not share a common ancestry with those features that are present in the plant lineage that we will talk about later. Um, and almost all uh, members of this group, I think all that have been studied are photosynthetic. Um, the second group of stromenopiles are the diatoms, and again, um, you, you may actually, uh, more use in sort of the common uh, descriptions of organisms, this term is also used. Uh, they are generally single cellular. They have incredibly complex and interesting morphologies that's sort of highlighted in this um, little diagram here from, from the book. And in part because of the, what's on the outside of these cells, not only interesting morphologies, but it preserves very well in fossils. They have an incredibly elaborate fossil record and lots of information is known about the evolutionary history of diatoms via that fossil record. And again, when morphology is informative to what type of organism that you see, then you can add an incredibly rich historical background by incorporating fossil information, and you're able to, in many cases, classify the organisms you see in fossils based upon their phenotypic appearance. Globally, diatoms contribute to about 20% of the global carbon fixation on the planet, and that's very important for things like global climate change and the total CO2 in the atmosphere. And fossil diatoms are frequently the source of the um, organic compounds that turn into oil and gas in a variety of you know, oil and gas preserves. Um, all right, and then the third lineage of stromenopiles is very different in many ways from the other two lineages of stromenopiles. 
None of the representatives of this group are photoautotrophic. They are all what are known as absorptive heterotrophs. Um, they basically work um, by secreting compounds that then digest or break down material outside of the cell and then they bring that back into cells, their cells. That's a property also seen in fungi, as we will talk about when we talk about fungi. And in fact, if you look at um, these organisms in you know, their growth structures and if you look at their cells in a microscope, they look a lot like fungi and they were originally misclassified as fungi, but they are not really even remotely closely related to fungi. This group includes the causative agent of the Irish potato famine, uh, it causes this thing called potato late blight. It also includes the causative agent of the sudden oak death, which is killing a lot of the oaks in the Sierras and in California. And again, I mentioned this before, because they are not actually closely related to fungi, the way you deal with infections of these organisms is actually very different, despite their phenotypic similarities to fungi. Um, so now we have an exciting other clicker question. which relates to these oomycetes. So the similarity in appearance of the oomycetes to fungi is an example of which of these? Give you until 1.15 or so. Everyone ready? All right. I won't do that dramatic. Oh, did this kick out? Hang on. All right, we are back. Um, so this is, this is an example of homoplasy, right? Because homoplasy is when you have two distinct lineages that have a similarity, but that similarity is not the result due to common ancestry. It's due to separate evolutionary events, for example, by convergent evolution. And it turns out that this, um, what you see with oomycetes and fungi, I also mentioned, you also see with the high GC gram-positive bacteria, there are many lineages of microbes that have converged upon somewhat similar um, patterns of growth and lifestyle patterns that are probably the result of some common selective property and convergent evolution. And it has led to many sort of mistakes in the classification of organisms as well as um, sort of limitations in how people deal with those organisms and having an improved uh, classification in these cases largely based upon molecular sequence data because the phenotypic information is misleading for these organisms in terms of what their classification is. Are there any questions about that before we... All right, so... 
Um, the next uh, major group of eukaryotes here is um, the Rhizaria, and there are three lineages of Rhizaria. There, um, you may be familiar with sort of the byproducts of the biology of these organisms, even if you don't know the groups or the individual representatives. The Circozoans are very strange, very poorly understood. Most of them, um, you know, have been observed maybe in the microscope, but not characterized in detail in the laboratory. Some have been found in pond water and other aquatic environments. They've also been found in soil. Um, we will talk about them again when we talk about the evolution of chloroplasts uh, in, a, in the next lecture, because um, a few of these lineages have chloroplasts that have a very interesting evolutionary history within them. But the, the group in general is very poorly understood. The second group within the Rhizaria is much better understood. They're called the foraminiferans. Um, and they're characterized in particular by these shells that they secrete that are made up of calcium carbonate. And for example, the uh, discarded shells of individual foraminiferans or dead foraminiferans are what um, is converted. It eventually makes up limestone. And many sands on beaches are also made up of the shells of either just discarded shells or dead shells from uh, different foraminiferans. And again, like the diatoms, the identification of foraminiferans is pretty good from their morphology and phenotype, and that has led to sort of good matching of fossil foraminiferans with particular lineages. And on top of that, there's good date information for when particular foraminiferan lineages have shown up, and you can then use the presence of those particular foraminiferans in particular bands of sedimentary rock to reasonably accurately estimate the date of that rock without doing any other method like carbon dating or using other types of approaches. It's the presence of particular foraminiferans is a pretty good indicator as to um, what time period you're looking at. Um, they, uh, a lot of them have these um, thread-like, you can see it in this um, image here, these sort of branched thread-like pseudopods that stick out on the outside of the cell and they get coated with this really sticky substance and they use this basically to create a big gooey net that they collect plankton and other material with which they then eat. Um, and I just thought I'd mention this is a, a very unusual representative of the foraminifera called the xenophyophore and it's from a group of foraminiferin that are primarily found in the deep, deep sea, a couple of miles down in the bottom of the ocean on marine sediments. And this particular one here was about the size of a fist, and it's a single cell. So um, it's a very, very large single cell. It has many nuclei, so what happens is the cell will make copies of the nucleus, but not actually divide into multiple descendant cells. They'll all stay together inside one sort of giant growing uh, cell. And I, um, I know a little bit about this organism because I um, was on, I used to do deep sea research, and I was on a deep sea research cruise where people were using the Alvin submarine to go down to the bottom of the ocean to look for uh, organisms. And uh, I wasn't going down in the Alvin, but um, on one of the dives, a uh, graduate student from Woods Hole got to go down in the dive in the Alvin. So the Alvin is a fiberglass hull that's maybe, I don't know, 25 feet long, has, you know, the motors and other things. And then there's like a six foot diameter titanium sphere that three people sit in in the middle of this and go down two or two and a half miles into the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and it's, um, you know, people who work on this, it's very rare to get a chance to go down in this submarine into the bottom of the ocean. So the fact that this graduate student got to go in this dive, she was very, very excited about this. Um, and she had this amazing background, which was she had been spending something like a year or two years studying all of the different types of organisms that had been observed by Alvin and building a big catalog of the biodiversity of different organisms that had been observed in the bottom of the ocean. And um, when you're in the Alvin in the bottom of the ocean, there's usually a pilot who's driving the submarine. Most of the time, that's like an ex-Navy representative. Occasionally, it's a scientist um, who also happens to be an Alvin pilot. And then two 
scientists and you're looking through these tiny little portholes out into the dark deep sea with lights shining from the outside of the submarine. And she was doing this, she was in the dive and here's the video from one of the cruises and they're cruising along in the bottom of the ocean looking for things to pick up and this shows up and the two other people in the cruise just ignored it um, and she went crazy. And she knew what it was. She knew it was this weird, giant, single-celled organism. They actually leave tracks in the bottom of the ocean. They move very, very slowly, but they leave uh, trails behind them. And she realized what this was and used one of the arms of the submarine to pick it up and put it in a basket and bring it up to the surface of the ship. Um, and uh, I was the only microbial dork on the ship. Um, <laughs> on the surface, and so I got, I got this. It's in my freezer here. <laughs> um, and we've been doing some genetic and genomic characterization of different pieces of it. Um, and if you Google xenophyophore, um, there's a description of this organism in Wikipedia. I had nothing to do with this, but it actually has the picture of the actual individual cell that I have in the freezer, um, is in the Wikipedia definition of this group. So. Um, it's just that when the submarine went down to the bottom of the ocean originally and they'd see these like lumps with trails behind them, I don't think anybody thought that they were single-celled organisms crawling around on the bottom of the ocean. Um, anyway, just side story there. So um, the third group of Rhizaria are um, radiolarians and again, like diatoms and foraminiferans and many of the other groups of microbial eukaryotes. They have very interesting complex um, cell structures on the outside of the cells and in this case many of them so secrete this sort of glassy-like material that creates these skeletons with incredibly elaborate designs and again those preserve very well in sediments so they have a very interesting and elaborate fossil record. Um, I don't uh, no, um, I think in most cases you can also precisely identify them from the fossil record, like with foraminiferans, but I don't know if they're as useful for dating. I don't think they have as good stratification of exactly when different ones occur, like was used with the foraminiferans. But they have some really interesting uh, biological properties. All right. Um, continuing on your Friday tour of weird microorganism. Um, the excavate group is actually made up of uh, five major groups. Um, two of them here we'll talk about together because they're reasonably closely related and they have one very interesting feature that they share in common. Um, and that's this diplomonad and parabasalid group. So Giardia, uh, you may be familiar with. It's the causative agent of a lot of gastrointestinal problems throughout the world. Um, it's one of the reasons why if you go camping or backpacking you want to somehow sterilize the water you get out of a lake or a river because Giardia is frequently found certainly in the United States and it can make very unpleasant gastrointestinal disturbances. Um, it's a representative of the diplomonad group. Trichomonas vaginalis is one of the best studied representatives of the parabasalid group. It causes uh, sexually transmitted disease. And um, one really interesting thing that they share in common is that uh, both of them, this is a little video of Giardia going on in the background, both of them do not have mitochondria. So um, since, I haven't shown you the evidence, but we will in the next lecture, since it's been shown that the mitochondria symbiosis originated prior to the existence of the common ancestor of all the eukaryotic groups, that means that lineages that don't have a mitochondrion have lost it subsequently after they once had a mitochondrion in the past and they have subsequently lost the mitochondria. So this is a derived condition of these uh, two lineages and there's some really interesting studies uh, relating to what in essence they do to compensate for the absence of a mitochondrion. Um, a second lineage of excavates are the heterolobosians. Um, again, I'm, you probably, I would bet very few people have heard of the 
lineage here, but you almost certainly have heard sensationalist stories about representatives of this group. So there's a species in the genus Neglaria that is the causative agent of the brain-eating disease that gets in the news every once in a while. Um, it comes usually via water, either drinking water or um, if you're swimming and you have a cut, it can get into your system and eventually it makes it w its way to brains and then start, you know, it doesn't eat your brain, but um, it sort of degrades brain material and it's pretty nasty. It's not that common, but it's uh, pretty nasty. And this group is an example of what we will see in many of the other lineages of microbial eukaryotes is that they spend most of their lives as a, as a blob, as an amoeboid form. Um, these amoeboid forms are basically, uh, they don't have a hard cell wall, they have a cell membrane, sometimes they have other material, carbohydrates and things outside of the cell, but they glide around in various environments and they are really good at swallowing various material, bacteria, other um, microbial eukaryotes, archaea, other material from their environment, um, and uh, I think that um, the members of this group, I don't think any of them are um, pathogenic, but uh, I mean, sorry, photosynthetic, but I'm not sure. And then one other thing I thought I'd point out is um, related to um, some lab exercises. Uh, this is an example of an organism like the chlamydias that I talked about before are bacteria that undergo life cycle stages in the course of an infection. These neglaria can also undergo major changes where they switch between a flagellated form and this amoeboid form. And it led to many cases where people mistakenly thought that people were infected with multiple different species when it was just one species that switched um, its phenotypic properties. Second to last group of the um, excavates that we're going to talk about are the euglenids. It includes this um, euglena species that's used in a lot of introductory biology courses. It's um, photosynthetic. Many, but not all of the members of this lineage are photoautotrophic, but a lot of them um, are either heterotrophic all of the time, or in fact, there are examples of members in this group that can switch pretty rapidly between heterotrophy and photoautotrophy, that's relatively unusual. Um, many organisms are either dedicated heterotrophs or autotrophs. And we will again talk about them when we talk about the evolution of chloroplasts because they also have a strange evolutionary history to the chloroplasts that they use for photosynthesis. So all eukaryotes that are photoautotrophic have chloroplasts inside of them that are originally derived from cyanobacteria. That is, um, none of them invented photosynthesis themselves. They all, in essence, stole photosynthesis by incorporating a cyanobacterium inside of their cells. And it turns out that there was one evolutionary event where a cyanobacteria was recruited to become the chloroplast, and all other chloroplasts are derived from that original evolutionary event. But the history of that is a little complicated, and that's what we'll talk about a little bit in the next uh, lecture. And then um, the last group of the excavates are the kinetoplastids. And these um, are, have a synapomorphy. If you look inside their mitochondria, they contain this particular structure called a kinetoplast. And that's a structure where you find multiple circular DNA molecules and some other concentrations of various proteins. You can see it with particular stains in the microscope and it's one of the hallmark features of this group of organisms. And you can, um, many of them cause uh, nasty human diseases like Chagas disease, sleeping sickness, leishmaniasis, a lot of tropical diseases. They're all transmitted by some type of arthropod vector. Uh, insects in many cases, uh, bugs sometimes, uh, sometimes mosquitoes, sometimes other uh, arthropods. Uh, they're um, predominantly in tropical areas, but you can find them in other places. All right, uh, so um, one more major lineage here.
of the, the ones that aren't plants and animals and fungi together. And that's the amoebozoans. And these all contain species that spend a lot of their life as these amoeboid forms sort of crawling around and um, trying to take up food from their environment. But many of the representatives in these groups actually have multicellular forms within their life cycle, and I'll show you some examples of that. So the first group are these uh, Lobosians. They're actually, pretty much all of them live as single cells. Many of them have chloroplasts uh, that also have a strange evolutionary history. Again, we'll come back to that. Um, a bunch of them secrete this uh, sticky glue-like substance, substance and then collect little particles of dirt or sand around them. It's kind of like the hermit crabs that pile things all around the outside of their shell, but these are single-celled organisms that do the same general uh, property to protect themselves and to, I think they have some symbioses with other organisms that are found in the dirt. Uh, there's a story that was in the news yesterday about one representative of this lineage. There's a species called Entamoeba histolytica that's the causative agent of many cases of dysentery in millions of people around the, the globe get infections with this particular organism. And there was a study that was just published yesterday and that's getting a lot of uh, news coverage where researchers showed that what these organisms actually do is basically um, if they infect your gut, they're going to attack your gut cells. And what they do is take little bites out of your, your gut cells, sort of nibbling on them, which is a type of feeding that has not been observed in any of these groups before. This is a little time-lapse video of one of them doing it, and then this other one is a 3D reconstruction of it going around and nibbling on a gut cell and then bringing part of it inside. Um, and it just, it was on NPR yesterday when I was heading home, so I just thought it was kind of, kind of a cool new story um, for those who like weird microorganisms. Um, yeah, so before you get too freaked out, this is sped up like 50-fold or 100-fold. I'm going to start it over again. It's a plasmodial slime mold uh, crawling along a surface. Um, it's a colonial a group of many, many cells that are uh, together and crawling along a surface. This is where many of the you know, concepts of the blob in movies have probably come from. After rainfalls around here, you can frequently see these little um, Fisarium-like representatives of this group. They form these fruiting bodies growing up on um, uh, bark chips and other materials. Yeah, it's going to keep on going until it gets out into the crowd. Um, and uh, they're um, usually found in cool, moist habitats. And they, again, largely sort of move around by this crawling uh, process and take up food, again, like many of the amoeboid cells, by this um, wrapping and enveloping food particles. And then the last uh, group of the amoebozoans is another group of slime molds. They're um, evolutionarily distinct, so they've come up with two different names for these lineages, but they are related to each other. Uh, these are called cellular slime molds, and I'm going to run this video uh, in the side here while I talk about the life cycle over here. So there's a model organism that's used in a lot of laboratories around the world to study developmental processes in microbes. And this is called, a species is called Dictyostelium. And this species basically goes through this really interesting life cycle which um, has a single celled part of its life cycle and then you get this collection of cells grouping together until you get these giant aggregated amoebas like the slime mold I showed you in the other video. And then they develop these fruiting bodies and eventually the fruiting body is the source of reproductive um, spores that are used for generating the next generation. And there's a lot of research on this organism because people are interested in why these cells would collect together and what leads them to form colonies. It's sort of a primitive or simple form of multicellularity. I'm not going to, yeah, it's running away from something like the heat of the video. And there it's starting to form these stalks, and eventually those will release spores. All right, so um, in the, in, uh, what I'm going to do now is cover just quickly the two remaining groups, even though mostly we're going to talk about them later. Um, so the plantae is one of those two groups. 
and it's made up of five major lineages, the land plants being one of them, and we will talk about them a lot more later in the course. The sister group to the land plants are called the caraphytes. We will also talk about those later, and I'm just going to quickly show you a little bit about these other three lineages. So the glaucophytes, there's not, as far as I know, a lot known about this group. It's not as well studied as the other representatives of the plantae lineage, but there's one really interesting feature about this group. They have chloroplasts. The chloroplasts that they have have peptidoglycan between an inner and an outer cell membrane. So if you remember back to discussions about peptidoglycan, this is an important piece of information when trying to infer the evolutionary history of chloroplasts. The appearance of individual bacterial cells is not a good indicator as to what they are, but peptidoglycan is a little bit better of an indicator. And that relates to another clicker question, which is over here. Which of the following groups do not have peptidoglycan in their cell envelopes? All right, I'm going to give you till 115 here. Everyone got an answer in? Yeah, no? All right, I'm going to stop. All right, uh, the majority of you said D. That is correct. Um, so the other three are bacterial lineages. Presence of peptidoglycan is a feature shared by all bacteria, except for the one example I told you, the mycoplasmas, which have lost peptidoglycan. Archaea, for which Crenarchaeota are an example, do not have peptidoglycan. So this is a really important feature of these chloroplasts and glaucophytes. It's a key piece of evidence that has been used to support the model that chloroplasts evolved from cyanobacteria. Hold on a second. We're not quite done yet. Um, uh, two other lineages of the plantae group are the red algae and the chlorophytes, which are also sometimes known as the green algae. Um, many of the red algae are multicellular, although not all of them are. Many of them are marine. It appears that the multicellularity in many of the red algae has evolved separately from the multicellularity in land plants, as we will see later. The chlorophytes contain both single-celled representatives and multicellular representatives. Again, it may be that their multicellularity has separately evolved. You can see many of them sort of on coastal areas, um, washed up on the shore is where many people observe them. For land plants and caraphytes, we will talk about them when we talk about plant evolution. And for, hold on, hold on. And for fungi, coenoflagellates, and animals, we will also talk about them when we talk about animal and fungal evolution. And I will leave you with a video to walk out on. Have a good weekend.